mean, it's interesting to me how people completely detach their memories and just sort of listen. You know, America loved China from 2001 to 2013 when their buying of treasuries looked like this, right? It was up and to the right at an exponential growth rate. And of course, we knew they had some, some, some human rights issues, but as long as they were sending us cheap Nikes, we didn't care. All right, uh, Mr. Luke Roman, welcome to On the Margin. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Michael. It's great to be here. I'm excited to talk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've got a lot to a lot to cover today. Uh, but before we kind of get into it, I'm sure our our audience will be pretty familiar with with who you are at this point. You put out a lot of really great content. But for those of them who are not, could you just give us a quick uh, background and kind of overview of what you do at Forest for the Trees? Absolutely. So uh, at Forest for the Trees, or FFTT for short. We aggregate a large amount of publicly available information in a unique manner trying to identify developing economic bottlenecks. Uh, and mm. uh, I spent uh, almost 20 years on the investment research sell side in equity research and then in sales. And it was always my experience that those sectors uh, that stood to either benefit from or be hurt by uh, what I call economic bottlenecks. So just basically different factors coming together to create either very acute opportunities or very acute threats to various businesses. Those sectors tended to be the ones that outperform the most or underperform the most. A perfect example is in 2007, 2008, uh, it didn't matter if you own the best, most well-capitalized home builder. Uh, if you did, it only went down 80% instead of 100%. So those are the types of things. We're really looking for these big macro themes, these tectonic shifts that are happening. Uh, and uh, we uh, spent a lot of time uh, just reading, trying to find uh, data points. I don't really start with any particular thesis. I just read voraciously. And I don't know what grabs me about things when I see them, but when I do, uh, I set it aside in a cutting room and then we revisit the cutting room to produce research on a weekly basis and just try to see what we're seeing and let the data speak to us. And it's been a process that's worked really well for us, really worked really well for our clients, most importantly. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I love most about the content that you produce is just this rich view of history uh, that really comes across in your work. And actually, in doing my own research for this interview, I actually compiled about uh, 10 pages of notes. So this is going to be a six hour interview. So everyone just buckle <laughs> in, <laughs> strap in for that. Um, but I feel like, you know, where I'd love to actually start is this great framework I think that you've given, um, which is what we're looking at right now, just in, in the macro landscape in general, can be explained by one of the first uh, bubbles uh, in sovereign debt, at least in developed nations that we've seen in almost a century. Can you just unpack that idea a little bit more for us? Absolutely. Yeah, we've been very vocal about saying this is the first global sovereign debt bubble in 100 years. And it's it's something emerging markets have seen uh, early 2000s in certain parts of the world, late 90s in certain parts of the world. You had problems in the late 80s. Uh, it, it, it's been sort of a, a rotating crisis, rolling crisis for them. Actually, on a sovereign basis, the emerging markets are relatively, uh, because they went through all that, uh, in decent position relative to the developed markets. But for the developed markets in particular, it's the first time we've had a, a, a sovereign debt bubble since the immediate aftermath of World War One, in our view. Mm -hmm. And the reason we say that is uh, if you take a look back in history, we go back to 2000, the uh, U.S. was actually running surpluses, debt to GDP was low, We very good position. We had a, a, an equity market bubble, it popped, and instead of policymakers letting the economic impacts of that basically work themselves off, uh, they made a political choice, and the political choice was to kick the problem upstairs to the banking system by creating a housing bubble. And uh, they, they, it was a conscious choice on some level. You can go back and find comments by Paul McCulley at PIMCO recommending the Fed have a housing bubble to stimulate mm -hmm. demand. Paul Krugman famously echoed McCulley's sentiments in the New York Times, and you can find those still online. They said, we need a housing bubble to replace the demand lost from the burst stock bubble. So they made a policy choice, which is fine. Uh, it is what it is. That bubble, of course, burst famously in 2008. And again, we faced a choice. Uh, we could let the system work off the excesses through basically a measure of austerity, et cetera, or we could kick the problem upstairs to the sovereign level. We could have the government backstop everything. And again, they made a political choice. I understand why they did it. Uh, and so here we are today. The government has backstopped everything. We've got rates at all-time lows. And 
when you look at debt to GDP in the US, uh, in, in the UK, in Japan, in these developed markets, um, there's basically this incredible setup where um, there's nowhere else to kick it upstairs to. Number one, uh, well, right. now that now that you know there's 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 nobody backstopping the government other than the currency. They they're printing press. They can print as much as they need to. They're not going to nominally default. And so when you say as a global sovereign debt bubble, uh, it's really a, a currency bubble. It's a fiat currency bubble. And because they're going to ensure, you know, basically from this point, there's a decision tree. Do they default on their obligations? And for in the U.S., I spend a lot of time on the U.S. for a number of reasons. Number one, it's it's uh, where uh, I'm most familiar. Number two, it's the biggest player. Uh, number three, right. it's the reserve currency issuer. Uh, and so the U.S. has a choice. Uh, it can default on treasuries. It can slash defense spending, or it can default on 70 million baby boomers and significantly cut their entitlements, or it can print the money. And historically, sovereigns with a fiat currency uh, have been very reticent to shrink their governments, sh default on their obligations for lack of, of, of printing a purely fiat currency. And so when you go back in history, last time there were, as there was a global sovereign debt bubbles after World War I, uh, there were six major industrial powers, the U.S., the U.K., uh, Germany, France, Russia, and Japan. And when you date it starting in 1918 at the end of the war, you really could say 1919, uh, Within four years, two of the six had completely hyperinflated. Uh, that was mm -hmm. Russia and Germany. Uh, and within 12 years, all six had seen the value of their sovereign debt collapse against gold by anywhere from 75 to 100 percent. So you, you, you know once you get to this stage, it becomes a decision tree of default or print. We can see the printing. They're go likely going to keep printing. The political Im impetus is such that we're likely going to keep printing. And so once we understand this, we understand how it worked out in history, we can start to make some better informed decisions about how we want to allocate our capital. Yeah. Luke, what do you think the cost of the printing is? I feel like one thing that's getting uh, an idea that's getting bandied around right now is pe people have started to believe that you can get something for nothing and that printing money doesn't have consequences or release valve. In your mind, what, what is the most important consequence to, to understand uh, about printing money? I think it is um, the thing I will, uh, I, I think policymakers have done a, a, a number of things well. One of the things they've done really well is stretch the system out, um, mm -hmm. you know, stretch the printing out. Last time it happened much faster in, in part because you couldn't do some of the things they've done with derivatives, et cetera. But when you talk about what the costs are, uh, there are a lot of the things we've already started to see and are now seeing accelerate. So record levels of wealth inequality, particularly, and that's some of that's a, a structure of the currency system, but that's, mm -hmm. that is uh, when you see in 1971 what happened to the gap between, uh, between wealth, you know, the, the, the wealthiest and, and the working and middle classes, that I think is a cost of it. Ultimately, you get into political costs. It, it shakes out in inflation, and then it shakes out in your political costs. And uh, what you can see is that historically, uh, declining real living standards, whether those are living standards declining on a nominal basis or on a real basis, they can only decline for so long before it starts to show up at the ballot box. And that's mm -hmm. where things start to get interesting. And I think, uh, you know, 2008, I, I would argue... Uh, Obama was really the first populist in a way. Uh, he was riding in on, uh, on the heels of the first crisis. Uh, he was talking about different things. He was talking about hope and change. The reality was is he was sort of no different than the five presidents before him in any real way, four presidents before him in any real way from a policy standpoint. So then we got a little bit more extreme in 2016. We get the, you know, we get Trump and we sort of go all the way to the other side. And uh, there were some things that he did do differently. There were a lot of things he didn't do differently. Uh, and so now, you know, we're, again, it's always about optionality, about what the choices are. Um, you know, Biden is, I think, another of more of the same, but you watch some of the policies he's following, and the policies are actually, are actually different than the prior uh, four or five, six presidents. And so we'll see, but ultimately it really, uh, the, the, the real cost of printing money it, 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 it comes out on the social and the political front it's via uh, inflation and, and how citizens in a democracy react to that inflation. Yeah. I mean, in my mind, it's all about, um, again, you know, with a view towards history, it's, it's all about 
income inequality, right? If, if you look at that chart, right, there's this great website, what WTF happened in 1971, right? And there's this amazing chart of just, you look at the difference in, in wages between the, the kind of top 1% and, and the rest of America. And it's just, it's this gap that just continues to get wider and wider and wider. And if you look historically, there's only, there's only so long that um, people are going to put up with a system like that. Right. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're lucky, it kind of finds its way to the ballot box. Um, but if you're unlucky, you wind up with a French revolution type situation and it's a heads on sticks uh, type thing. No, that, that, that's right. And it's, and it's hard because really everyone's created equal. But then there are different talents and different abilities and different luck and different times where different skills are valued differently. And then technology is also very much a, a wealth inequality driver. Uh, it really mm. accrues sort of an all or nothing. Uh, there have been a couple different authors, I think Anan uh, Girididis, uh, uh, and I'm sure I mispronounced that. He's done some work about just how there's sort of this <laughs> all or you know, winner take all dynamic within technology. Um, and so I think if that speaks to, you know, a couple things, right? It, it's it's a policy. Ultimately, if you have a system that is creating inequality, um, and there are certain people with more rewardable skills, right? I mean, Tom Brady makes whatever he makes as a quarterback. A hundred years ago, Tom Brady could not have made that as a quarterback, and we look at that, and that's fine. And you know, no one questions that because. He's won six Super Bowls. He's, it's, there's nothing more meritocratic than the NFL. If he couldn't hack it, he'd have been gone a long time ago. Uh, but with that said, in the broader society, to your point, uh, if we just let society be purely meritocratic like that and say you either, you know, you're either, you can either make the league or you get cut, and if you cut, get cut, you, you, you starve, that's where you get into these political problems. And so it, it really comes down to a policy angle of, okay, for those that are disenfranchised by technology or, or, or don't have the skill set that is being rewarded in this particular cut, what are we doing for those right. people from a policy standpoint? And for the last 20, 30 years, sort of this, well, the market takes, you know, the market will take care of it, uh, hasn't worked. And in particular, since 2008, the, the, there, there's been. Americans abide a lot. They'll take a lot. What they don't abide well as a culture is hypocrisy. And the hypocrisy of let the market figure it out for 30 years and then everybody in the banking sector gets these bailouts uh, was not lost on people. And I think we're seeing the payback from that from a political standpoint really beginning in 2016 and continuing to today. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And on one side of this, a lot of people tend to look at what's going on in the world and ascribe whatever current uh, politicians are doing, right? And saying, hey, this politician is doing this and, and that's why there's this outcome. But really, there's, there's a lot of structural components here. And, and what I love about your work is that you really, really dive deep into the structural uh, kind of economics and markets, um, you know, components of why decisions are happening. So can you explain a little bit about, just let's zoom out for a second, like how is the current monetary system constructed with the dollar at the center? And how's that leading to some of these political problems? Sure. So... I guess if you if you if you want to zoom out a bit, you can go back to a couple key points in time. I think, and I'm going to do this quickly because uh, I don't want, I don't want to bore the listeners. But you go back to to Bretton Woods as World War II is winding down in 1944. They get mm. together at Bretton Woods. At that point, it was obvious we were going to win. It was just how long it was going to take and how many more casualties were going to be suffered. And uh, they 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 want to construct a new currency system. And there's two options on the table. There's the John Maynard Keynes Bancor. B-A-N-C-O-R, and it's basically a neutral reserve asset, a uh, basket of, of commodities that floats in all currencies and basically would be a self-regulating system where if one uh, trading nation got too big a surplus, their currency would, would strengthen against the bank core um, and uh, uh, their goods would become less competitive and those that were running deficits would weaken, vice versa. And, and the system would self-regulate over time. You'd prevent these imbalances. So that was system one. System two was the U.S. system uh, proposed by Harry Dexter White, who was later accused of being a Soviet spy, by the way, which is interesting side history. Uh, no and the system that he wanted was, or that the U.S. wanted, was uh, the U.S. dollar at the center of it, pegged to gold at 35 an ounce, and then everything else tied to the dollar. And because we had all the men, all the factories, all the gold, all the oil, um, we... we we, we threw our weight around and we got that system. 
And it immediately create, started creating problems throughout the 50s and into the 60s. Um, it came to a head in 1971, of course, or the late 60s, 1971, when Lyndon Johnson's running Great Society, uh, as well as fighting the Vietnam War. U.S. deficits are surging. U.S. Uh, trade partners, allies, began asking for their gold back. They began to realize there was no way they could make good, we could make good on our obligations under the Bretton Woods gold standard at $35 an ounce. So they started saying, give us the gold, you guys keep those treasuries. Uh, we closed the gold window in 71. It was supposed to be temporary. It's been 50 years, so uh, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program, <laughs> as the old saying goes. Right. And from that point on, we were in this, this, this new world where the U.S. dollar was the primary reserve currency, and more importantly, the U.S. Treasury bond was the primary reserve asset. So basically, the U.S. government, by their actions, substituted the treasury bond for gold. Mm. And that then completely begins to change the entire tenor of the global economic system, of U.S. society, uh, because suddenly it becomes, it basically gives the United States Dutch disease. It's almost like we found a giant gold mine yep. and that never ended, and it was located in Washington, D.C., and, and laundered, laundered's a bad word because of the connotation, but, but recycled through Wall Street. Uh, and so if you, beginning in 71, if you were tied to the treasury export business, you have done very, very well on a real basis. And if you were mm. uh, anything else, middle class, working class, you've basically been falling behind a little bit, but behind Washington, behind Wall Street, little by little every year for the next 50 years. Uh, we did, as you mentioned you know, before the show, uh, petrodollar was tied into that system as a way of enforcing it effectively, which was basically we, uh, we, we struck a deal with the Saudis. They would price oil only in dollars. They were the biggest swing producer, and uh, we provided some defense for them, et cetera. And so basically for the next 30 years, 32, 35 years, the U.S. was really focused on making the dollar as good as gold for oil. And you can see this. Basically, the Treasury bond was, um, you know, gold, so, or excuse me, oil sold for between 15 and $30 per barrel for 30 years. And when it got to 30, we'd raise rates. And when it got to 15, we'd cut rates. And we were basically managing, uh, I would say, almost a peg. If you look at the face value of a U.S. Treasury bond of $1,000 relative to a barrel of oil, we were basically pegging via our rate policy for 30 years uh, the value of treasuries to basically be as good as gold for oil. And some people liked the system, some people didn't. Uh, it worked. Uh, it, you know, importantly, it helped us defeat the Soviets in the Cold War. And so that was the, the offshoot was this 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 hurting of the of the working and middle class. 89 USSR collapses. We probably should have, should have had a new monetary system. We don't. We sort of press forward with the old one and some changes since then. The bottom line is that we've set up the, the, the system has enforced what's effectively US dollar Dutch disease, which Dutch disease is a famous economic concept where, um, you know, if it usually applies to oil producers. You find a bunch of oil, you start producing a lot of oil, the money is so plentiful and so easy and so free that the rest of everything else your economy does atrophies and you become sort of this monoline economy uh, to the detriment of, of sort of broader social stability, et cetera. And the U.S. basically found a giant pile of oil when we went to the petrodollar, uh, except it was the treasury bond. And, and everything else around, it's, it's not atrophied as fast, but particularly the working and middle classes have atrophied quite a bit. And so that's been sort of the, the, the structural components or the biggest elements of the structural components that have, uh, have gotten us to where we are. And that's when I say there should have been... In a, in a perfect world, you have better policy where you're doing better worker retraining, cheaper college, subsidized college, so things that would sort of assuage some of the frustrations that have been coming to the surface in the last 10 years. Those steps were not taken. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of what you're just describing is is um, what's called Triffin's Dilemma, right? Which was, um, you know, Triffin was an economist. I believe he was actually present. I love that you took it all the way back to Bretton Woods. Um, I think he was actually present at Bretton Woods and voiced um, some of the problems that would inevitably, uh, you know, accrue to the U.S. with the system that they were proposing with um, the reserve asset and the issuer of the reserve currency being the same entity. All right, so can you describe a little bit about what, what is Triffin's Dilemma and is that what we're really seeing play out in real time right now? Sure. So, yeah, Triffin's Dilemma is 
uh, he just identified the reality that if the U.S. was both the reserve currency issuer, um, it would need to run increasing deficits. If, if the reserve currency was, or the reserve asset in particular, was the uh, currency of a single sovereign nation, over time, uh, that nation would need to run deficits to supply the currency to the rest of the world for the economy to function. And that beyond a certain tipping point, those deficits and the ongoing debt would get so big that it would call into question the very solvency of the reserve currency and reserve asset issuer. And then the system would begin feeding on itself and basically lead to a collapse of the system as, as, it, as it turns into a giant game theory of uh, who, who leaves the system, whoever leaves the system first leaves it best. And so that has been... Uh, it's happened in real time. Uh, the first round of it was in the 60s when you started seeing people say, give us our gold back, the French and um, uh, the Dutch, uh, a number of others. There was a run on gold, and the U.S. nipped that in the bud by severing gold uh, convertibility. And ever since then, the release valve has really been the U.S. middle and working classes, effectively, is it basically they have suffered the brunt of basically We've subjugated the U.S. middle and working classes, offshore their jobs, offshore their factories, uh, to support this dollar system that benefited Washington, benefited Wall Street. During the Cold War, it made some sense. Post Cold War, it made no sense. Um, and so, it, it it is a we're basically when you tie that back to this global sovereign debt bubble, particularly for the U.S. Really, what I'm saying is, is that we are now so far past the tipping point that Triffin identified where the solvency of the reserve currency is, is being questioned. You look at it, uh, U.S. policymakers are openly saying it, w as long as we keep interest rates below the rate of nominal GDP growth, we can issue as much debt as we want. Our debt, our debt capacity is infinite. And mathematically, that's 100% true. It's wonkish, but it's true. The challenge is, is that What's implied is that you're going to be able to find enough idiots in the bond market who are willing to take a coupon from the United States that is substantially below the rate of nominal GDP growth in the United States. So basically, what you need to find is an increasing amount of the bond market to just willingly donate money to the U.S. government to keep doing what the U.S. government's doing. And the problem, of course, is in, in the real world that those idiots don't exist, not for any extended period of time and certainly not in the sizes that the U.S. government now needs with U.S. debt to GDP at 130 percent. And so Triffin's dilemma we're watching play out. Triffin's dilemma really is the, 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 the explainer of, of what is a global sovereign debt bubble in a certain way. It's, it's once you get past that tipping point for the reserve currency issuer, then, you know, the bubble is, is there's, you know, a bubble they define as, as some sort of uh, dynamic that started, that it was originally grounded in reality, but now it's completely been detached from reality. And that's, that's really where we are, is if once you need to start asking the bond market to basically take a coupon nominally below nominal growth for extended periods of time, you're, you're in a bubble. And that's ultimately why the Fed's balance sheet has had to do what it's done, because when there's not enough demand for, when there's not enough idiots in the bond market to take a coupon that, you know, are below G, then the Fed buys below because they have an infinite balance sheet. And that's when you say, you know, things play out in, in, in the currency markets when you have a sovereign debt bubble. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that you just said there that was super interesting caught my attention is that the, you know, the countries that exit best will be the ones that exit first, basically in the system. And if you look at, uh, you know, two countries have very different approaches to this, neither one of which are very friendly to the United States, uh, Russia and China, right? And you've seen probably the articles that, um, you know, Russia has stopped accumulating uh, treasury bonds and they're accumulating gold. And China has actually taken that even one step further, right? And they've, you know, kind of embarked on this whole one belt, one road infrastructure initiative and essentially traded, um, you know, U.S. credit for commodities and real hard goods. I mean, is that what we're watching right now? Are we watching countries kind of uh, exit, you know, one by one from the current system? Uh, and if so, like, what's, what's the next step? Uh, what's the next step of that look like? Yeah, in a word, that's exactly what we're watching. I mean, it's interesting to me how people completely detach their memories and just sort of listen. You know, they 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 don't they don't sort of put the context of history because it's not that long a history ago. America loved China from 2001 to 2013 when their buying of treasuries looked like this, right? It was up and to the right at an exponential growth rate. 
Uh, it was only when China came out in November 2013, and of course we knew they had some, some, some human rights issues, but as long as they were sending us cheap Nikes, we didn't care. Mm. Um, and, buy, and, and, and recycling the dollars from those selling us those cheap Nikes into treasury bonds. We didn't care. Uh, it was only when, in November 2013, that the PBOC said it's no longer in our interest to grow FX reserves, which was basically, we're not going to buy any more treasuries, uh, that suddenly the rhetoric really started to get much more edgy. Same thing with Russia. Um, you can see uh, right around the same time that the whole uh, uh, Ukraine slash Crimea thing happened, the Russians stopped buying treasuries a little bit before and started buying gold. Uh, which is absolutely an attack on the dollar in the same way that the French were doing. And we did the same thing to the French. The French were our friends. We love the French. Oh, they want their gold. The French are terrible uh, back in the 60s. So it, it is really this great geopolitical game manifesting through economics at this point. Uh, and that's exactly what, in particular, China's been doing. I mean, the Russians are pretty straightforward about it. They are selling oil in euro. They're stockpiling gold. Um, they are, are, are selling oil uh, um, uh, to both to China and to the Europeans in Euro, actually expressing a willingness to sell in Yuan, maybe doing a little bit in Yuan around the margins. But you can see they're, they're, they're just being very direct about it. The Chinese are, are doing it in a number of different ways. Um, they will still take dollars. They take the dollars. They will you know, use the dollars or treasuries as collateral in the euro dollar market. They'll borrow more dollars. They lend those dollars out at a spread along the Belt and Road. So they're collecting a dollar spread and usually against some sort of hard asset collateral where what they really want is the hard asset collateral. They're basically getting out of their dollar position, um, you know, basically betting these dollars are going to be increasingly infinite. And so we're going to swap them for finite hard assets increasingly. And they've been doing that really for probably 10 to 12 years, but it's gotten much more pronounced in the last five to eight, maybe five to 12, five, five to seven years. Uh, but that's exactly what we're watching is basically those two opting out. Um, everyone always points to China and Russia um, as doing that. The Europeans quietly began opting out in 99, arguably, when, uh, the, Chi when, when, when uh, the euro was launched. Uh, the Europeans, in a surprise move, said, we're going to put 15% of eurozone reserves in gold, and we're going mark to mark the gold to market quarterly, which means basically as gold goes up, uh, the euro becomes more collateralized uh, by gold, uh, becomes more effectively gold-backed. And I think the goal here that is not well appreciated um, on most of Wall Street, the Europeans' goal, I think, was we know we need to be able to invoice for our biggest deficit item, energy, in euros. We want to buy energy in euros. But to make the euro attractive, we need to have a component that basically can say to the Arabs, look, we've got this gold angle. It, 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 we, if we print a bunch of euros to bail out you know, our banks, uh, gold goes up in euros, and the, the, the euro should actually do well. It's a ballast within their system. So if the Europeans were so enthralled with the dollar, they never would have put that 15% of gold into, in, in, into the reserves and importantly marked it to market quarterly because they would have just taken that 15%, put it all in treasury bonds, tied themselves to the dollar forever and, and gone on. So it's been this 20-year process and, and really probably more like 50 years when you look at some of the data, but we won't get into that. But the Europeans launched it in 99. Um, the Chinese, the Russians and the Chinese have followed in, in the late 2000s into the early 2000s. So you really look at it and you say it's, it's pretty much all of Eurasia. It's this gigantic landmass that is two-thirds of the world's population and 70% of the world's oil and, and, and most of gro uh, global GDP and most of global commodity consumption. And they've all kind of taken steps that opt out. And so the question is, is when does the geopolitical, does it become more? How do we fight back? What does the new system evolve to? Does it require war? And those are all questions that I think we're, 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 we still don't know the full answers to. We're watching evolve in real time. Yeah. So it seems like to sum up a lot of what we're talking about, you know, the way the monetary system is currently laid out with the U.S. at the center, it actually isn't long-term working for the United States, right? What we've done is we've, you know, through, uh, you know, systems like the petrodollar system, we've created these huge structural sources of demand um, for basically U.S. Uh, treasuries and, and U.S. issued debt. And then the people uh, who are involved in the, the export of that debt, that commodity, have made a ton of money. But you also have folks, both in Washington, I think, and 
you know, on, on FinTwit, right, who, who really believe this idea that having the U.S. at the, at the core, at the, you know, at the center of the current monetary system is a strategic imperative for the United States. What's the counter argument to everything that we're talking about? Why are some people so convinced that having the dollar at the center is necessary and good for the United States? <laughs> you you didn't load me up with that question. Huh? <laughs> I know. I'm just teeing them up for you here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to be gentle here. Um, generally speaking, so the good thing about having the dollar where it is, is that it has allowed uh, extremely expensive investments to be made into many of the technologies that we now appreciate and enjoy. A lot of those came out of the Defense Department, the defense budget, and that was, that was kind of the sacrifice that has been made, is you had the U.S. working and middle class suffer for 50 years, uh, but a lot of the technologies we have today came out of basically what was a, an, an effectively infinite defense budget that came up mm -hmm. with a lot of this stuff. Um, even the ability for you and I to talk like this today, the internet, all of this stuff was not all of it, but almost a, a, a large majority of this stuff were defense initiatives mm -hmm. basically created out of unlimited dollars. That's a really good thing. Those are productivity drivers, particularly when they're commercialized, uh, et cetera. Were it limited to just that, particularly if the benefits from that were better allocated into some policies to aid those that were bearing basically the cost of this unlimited money, the U.S. working in middle classes, I, I, don't, I don't think we would ever want to change that. The problem has come on a couple areas. Number one, gross strategic mismanagement. And by that, I mean the Iraq War, Afghanistan, were disasters. Particularly, if, okay, go over there, drop a few bombs, make a point, we can get you wherever you are, and then get out. You don't spend 20 years and $6 trillion just because you can you know, chasing guys around in Honda pickup trucks or Toyota pickup trucks with 50 calibers with, you know, the most impressive military the world's ever seen. It was, it was a gross strategic mismanagement of this dollar system. Number two, you, 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 you don't offshore everything to China to try to keep it going, uh, to try to basically address the bond market. You'd make structural reforms because, again, Penny wise, pound foolish. Um, you know, my grandfather and his generation fought in World War II, and when they got back, the first thing they did was not offshore the manufacturing that had built all their weapons to the USSR because labor yeah. in the USSR was 50% cheaper. They knew better. There was a um, optimism slash naivete, you pick, amongst policymakers in the late 90s in particular much of the 90s into the 2000s about China. And ultimately, uh, we offshored way too much capacity. And the challenge is there's a great quote in the book, Time to Start Thinking by Edward Luce. And um, it was, um, I believe it's from Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel. Mm -hmm. He said, we need to, this, he said this in 2011, we need to stop with the edict of potato chips, computer chips, what does it matter? He said, DARPA, the, the, the defense uh, um, skunk works, for lack of a better word, that has come up with a lot of the technology that we were referring to before, famously says, to invent, you must make. The invention of stuff happens when you're making stuff. A lot of times it's when you screw something up, you learn something. But if you're not making it, you're not making the discoveries. You're not getting better. You're just consuming. And so we shifted from this. The second strategic error was shifting the U.S. economy to basically this debt-fueled uh, consumer spending, government spending binge while we offshore all of the production and with it, a lot of the discovery to China. And so mm. when you find, oh my gosh, Huawei's already got 5G. How come we don't have 5G? Well, they're making the stuff. That's why. <laughs> and so that is the second gross error of, of, of what we've done. And because of those two gross errors, to tie back to your question, now, this system that had it been managed properly would have probably been something we'd never want to get rid of, is now being weaponized against us, where the Chinese can now borrow cheaply in dollars, 
because we didn't do anything about this for so long, they're the world's biggest trading partner. They are a bigger mm -hmm. trading partner with all of our allies, with all of our partners. And so we can't go to our partners and say, hey, we need you to cut off China for human rights violations. They look at us and they're like, are you crazy? Like, we're going to crash our economy because all of a sudden you don't like that they're not buying treasuries from you? Um, you know, they were doing the human rights stuff in Xinjiang long before you said something in your, mm -hmm. in your, you know, on CNN. And we're not going to crash our economies because they're too important for us. And we see mm -hmm. this playing out every day in the news wires, and we try to vilify it. And so it's really what it requires then is a change for uh, the U.S. to basically change the structure of this dollar system. Because if we don't change it now, again, because of these two... Uh, history books are going to be so unkind to the leaders of the time. They are the, the worst own goals in a long, long time. Mm. The, 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 the never-ending the never wars and then the offshoring uh, of too much production. Uh, we're now in a position where uh, ch the Chinese can borrow in euro dollars. Uh, they can lend out the euro dollars. Uh, if, the credit, or if the debtors on the other side of it don't pay up or don't have the collateral, or if the dollar gets too strong, guess who backstops the loan? It's the Fed with, with swap lines. So the Chinese are making, basically, like, gathering up the world. They are increasing their geopolitical power, their economic power, their resource security, uh, all with back, effectively Fed backstopped credit lines. Mm. Uh, and then they're using it against us as the U.S. military defends the trade lanes for them to bring the stuff back to China. It's, it's the most incredible system. And so when, I, when people say, well, we can't get rid of it, I think those people, they tend to be near the areas that have benefited from the, the euro dollar system the most. So they tend mm. to be Washington slash, uh, you know, sort of money center uh, cities. And I think they also tend to not realize exactly how much China is using the system against us. Because I've had conversations with them. They say, how could you possibly say we'd be better off? And I lay it out and they go, that's a good point. Like, that, that's a problem. <laughs> And I'm not the only one saying that. The Defense Department's been saying this for five years, six years, eight years, ten years. So they're aware of it. There's certain intelligence officials that are aware of it. Um, I think COVID did a lot to take that group of people in Washington in particular from sort of a small core group to a much bigger group of people realize that it's a problem, that our supply chains are a strategic weakness of, of our country. Uh, when people say, you know, hey, we need PPE, and they go, well, we got to go, we got to call and beg China for it. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, 70% of, of our pharmaceutical chain we couldn't make without China. Um, yeah. People start, that, that really, I think COVID, one of the you know, few positives that came out of it was, I think, a much greater awareness across a much greater number of people that two years ago, three years ago, would have defended this dollar system as structured to the death, now realizing that, okay, you know, there are some downsides to this. And those downsides, it's becoming more of an exorbitant burden than an exorbitant privilege. Yeah. I think not enough people just ask high level questions about what is the economy supposed to do? All right, there's this great, great quote from uh, C.S. Lewis, who is a, a logician. And he said, you know, if you trace anything down to the core argument, you'll find a, a human assumption, right? Uh, there's nothing that's, it's, it's all based on assumptions that people are making. And I think if you asked a lot of people, what's the point of an economy, right? You know, a lot of people would find their way to, to make money, right? To generate money. But I do not think that that's the point of an economy, right? The point of an economy is to provide means for your for your people. It's to provide sustenance. We're all humans at the end of the day. Money is a made up concept. At the end of the day, everyone needs the ability to work and, and earn and get enough food and shelter and all that kind of stuff. And I feel like in the current system, we've just completely forgotten that. And the people that are in charge are maybe, you know, in, in this most cynical or, or least generous kind of just kind of corrupt or, or not working in a way that's beneficial for people. Or, or people have just forgotten that this is what we're all supposed to be doing here. You know, we have to provide a means for people to earn a good living. And I think, like, to your point, the release valve has been the middle class for such a long period of time that, you know, people haven't just realized you can't keep doing this to people. You can't keep exporting their jobs away overseas. And if you look at who the beneficiary of the system has been for the last however many years, it's unquestionably China, right? Is that even a question? 850 million people raised out of poverty since the 80s. That's phenomenal, that's great. But there's no question, there should be no question who is benefiting from the system the most, and it is not the United States. I, th say. I think that's right, and it's, it's, 
And yeah, people coming out of poverty is a great thing. I think where they lost the script was sort of what, you know, to what ends, to what, you know, the, right. the, 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 what, 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 what were the leaders in China really after? And you can, there's any number of books you can read about that that would suggest that we've been naive since the Nixon administration regarding that. But, but to your question about what does an economy do, I think it's an excellent question. I think it is, I think it's arguably the most important question mm -hmm. over the next 10 years. And it's actually something that makes me as optimistic as anything these days. And, and what I mean by that is, your, your answer is, is a, a point of an economy is so that people can provide for themselves sustenance. And I think beyond sustenance, I think is meaning. I think it, mm -hmm. it's about having meaning. And when you see societies that lose meaning, what you see are record numbers of suicides, record numbers of opiate overdoses, alcoholism. We've seen these things before. We saw them in the 90s in Russia. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal, uh, an op-ed from 1998 or 99, asking, is Russia too sick to matter? And there's just these staggering, heartbreaking statistics where once the, once the Berlin Wall came down and sort of the entire structure of the Soviet economy collapsed, there was a whole group of, in particular, young men in Russia that simply had no meaning. They did, they, their lives had no meaning. Everything, the reason they got up for every day and went to work and did what they did there was gone. And so they just started, they drank themselves to death. I have a good friend of mine who is a Native American elder with the, with the Cheyenne Indian tribe. And he's described to me what happened when, you know, the U.S. government went out west and said, listen, there's 70,000 buffalo. They live on buffalo. If we shoot all the buffalo, they'll all starve to death and we can round them up and put them in, in reservations. And that was, and, and he, when he describes that they did shoot all the buffalo, the buffalo became nearly extinct. Their food source, the basis of their economy went away. And guess what you had? You had the alcoholism, suicides, these, these, these people. But again, a lot of them were, were men because the way their culture was structured, the women stayed home with the homestead. Uh, you had this loss of meaning uh, mm. that, again, and so when you look around, you know, you get a lot of addressing about symptoms uh, in our culture. Why, why yeah. did 87,000 people in the United States OD on opiates last year? 87,000. How many right. times did we hear that with all the tragic COVID deaths? I just heard it for the first time uh, last week that 87,000 people. That does include the suicides. It does include, and you can see the trends. It's, it's not happening in Europe. In Europe, there's this great article in the Wall Street Journal. In Europe, it's trending down. In America, it's spiking up. And so you say, well, why? And I think in no small part, it's exactly what you described, which was the economy has been reduced to this profit loss. You're a, either a cog in the part of the economy that makes money or you're not. And if you're not, get out of the way and, and you fall to the fringes of society. And when I say one of the things that gets me most optimistic over the next 10 years is the power of the internet and the potential changes we're seeing around the currency system right now, particularly around Bitcoin. Uh, but the power of the internet where you're starting to see uh, the U.S. moving towards being a, a, a nation of shopkeepers. Uh, whether it's me at FFTT where I would have had to have been in Goldman Sachs, in Bank of America, in Merrill Lynch to do what I do. Seven years ago, I was able to step, step out, do this. Twitter, I have a platform. People know who I am. I have 100,000 followers on Twitter. You, you, there's this very, it's very much a democratization of, 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 of the process. Uh, yesterday, you and I had to cancel with you last week. I was very under the weather. I finally had to get antibiotics yesterday. I was, felt like I was dying. I get on plush care and I meet with a doctor and I pay her $99 for 10 minutes of her time. She writes me in a script. She's a, a licensed and boom, there it is. But you sit there and go, she, does she need to be with, you know, so-and-so healthcare system or is it possible that she's a talented doctor and now because of the power of the internet, she has the ability to do it. Teachers could do this. Tutors could do this. We have tutors for our kids that are not located in our town, but are really good that meet with our kids and have helped our kids immensely in, with their schooling. Um, we saw the power of Zoom when one worked well with the COVID shutdown. So to the extent, A, that we have this technology that allows talented individuals, motivated individuals to follow their passions, whatever that is, whether that's medicine or finance or music or art, I mean, how many people are selling these beautiful art trinkets on, you know, this or that, you know, 
uh, internet site and making a living doing it. We can transform back to this, um, this, this, this nation of shopkeepers where there's a lot more meaning. Um, and, and that's a really positive thing. I think we can kind of keep developing that, keep transitioning toward that. In that manner, when you look at the currency system with, with Bitcoin and with a currency where you can store your wealth in something that they're not stealing it back from you, your time back from you, finite time, that too, I think is really, really critical to, uh, to giving meaning. And then you, know, then you talk about some policy things that can change where, listen, do we need UBI as we make these technological changes? We, we, we probably do. Um, you, know, you can't go from making whatever you make as a cog in the corporate wheel that you really have no meaning, you don't like it, you're at risk, you're, they just cut your health care, versus doing something you love, whether it's making music or you know, making trinkets or do, in finance, but you need a period of transition. Not everybody has the nest egg uh, saved up that they can make that transition. You transition. So manage properly the ability of the internet to give meaning, to really almost bring a second renaissance like Gutenberg's printing press did for the first renaissance is really, really exciting. Um, that's a long-winded answer, probably way more than you. You, you tapped into something no. I'm very passionate about. No, I, I, can, feel, yeah, I can feel the passion coming across. I, I completely agree with you, though. It's, I totally agree. And like, I want to obviously get into Bitcoin there a little bit later, but you, know, you brought up this idea, you know, the, the playbook for the United States. When you think about the United States, you can conjure up images of the United States in the 40s or the 50s. What do you think of? You think of manufacturing and you think of small business, right? At least that's what I think. That's the brand of the United States. Like there's this meritocracy. Anyone can do anything that they want. And, you know, when you think about the United States right now, what is our brand? That's completely changed. And look, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be manufacturing. That's not the point. But what you do need is a system with upward lubricant, right? And we don't have that upward lubricant anymore. And we're losing it. And I think you've identified a great area, the internet. Right, the internet provides it could it could transition us back to this nation of shopkeepers and creators. Maybe it doesn't look like you know someone opening up a corner store or a pharmacy. Maybe that's not the model anymore. Maybe it's a creator online and they have better access to distribution. And I think you're exactly right to to point to Forest for the Trees, right, as a great example of how someone with the right ideas and the right brain can be successful uh, without needing to be linked to these institutions. And I think overall, you know, what we're seeing right now, one of the biggest, most important trends. If you're a fourth turning guy is we're moving away from institutions that no longer serve us and you know that's happening across a whole bunch of different sectors it's happening across the media it's happening across education it's happening across currency money and banking right and that is my transition into bitcoin so i'd love to <laughs> so i'd love to i'd love to start talking a little bit i know, I know you're a, a big proponent of bitcoin what do you think the role that, that bitcoin has in this kind of transition or at the at the heart of the the new monetary system as you see it so for me you know my journey to bitcoin started with gold and it started in 2008 when i just it made no sense to me that in, in what was clearly a peak cheap oil world that the sponsor of the system was printing money to make ends meet i mean you can't a system physics says that you there's no such thing as a perpetual motion machine and so for me, my, ver my, my, my journey to gold was just how can we print money with keystrokes and buy the most important commodity in the world with it without there being repercussions? Without, you, you have to settle. If I'm, if I'm the oil seller, and we're all oil sellers in our end, right? We're all, and we're all sellers of energy. Our, our time is our energy, and we're all selling our energy we're trading our energy for sustenance. And so if you're an energy seller, how can you trade your time for money that's melting by design? That makes no sense. Uh, maybe from a top-down perspective, it does, certainly from the policymakers who want to sort of stay in power, the politicians. But from the individual perspective, that really what you need to have to have a, a very robust economy makes no sense. And so I started off by buying gold um, and, and then, you know, I always joke with my wife, one of my, my big regrets in life is, as I did hear about Bitcoin fairly early by virtue of my seat I was in, the people I was talking to. Um, I mean, I know several Bitcoin billionaires, <laughs> uh, certainly a couple of them. Um, and 
you know, I had heard through the gram, like, yeah, these guys are buying Bitcoin. And I didn't know where, and I didn't push and ask. And they weren't, they weren't being real aggressive about saying, hey, go. But they were, like, having to go to all these obscure places to buy it and stuff, right? It was not, like, this easy trade, like, people make it out in their head of, like, well, if, if I just would have bought Bitcoin at a dollar in, whatever, 2010, I'd be great. And it's like, well, it wasn't that easy, right? But there was no point being is, back then. It, you had to What's get that? into like you, there's no Coinbase or anything back then, right? There there's nothing. These, like, oh, you like, like they were like going to like video game things and like going to friggin' like you know South yeah, America and stuff to find. It. I mean, it was crazy. It was yeah, it was Tor. If you wanted to get into your browser and buy it, it was this. It seriously looks like you're entering the Matrix. Honestly, is what it looked like <laughs> buying back then. It was like you had this black screen. It's all black, like a little script, and you're like, I have no idea how to work any of this stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, so it's you know, but once I heard about it, and again, I probably heard about it in. 11 or 12, maybe first, you know, really started hearing about it both on the trading floor, but that, you know, you started hearing Raul Paul, I think was very much a, a high profile guy talking about it early on to his credit. Um, it clicked immediately. Just this, wait a second. This is a currency that is explicitly tied to energy. It floats in energy terms. This makes perfect sense as a reserve asset. I always thought it was it made way more sense as a reserve asset than as a currency itself. Um, I bought the first Bitcoin I ever owned in early first half of 13, um, owned a fair bit, have owned it the whole way. But what I really, that for me, what Bitcoin really is, does, the power of it is this dynamic that it allows you to store energy expended today in a reserve asset that will move with the cost of energy in the future. So it's no longer I can spend energy today for a currency that's going to lose money by design against the cost of energy, against my cost of living uh, as I go on. Um, and that to me is in a nutshell the power of it. I think that's really to me the most interesting thing about it. Um, yeah, I think I, I, that's how I think about it. Um, you know, I, I stay out of the technology stuff. I've got, you know, a number of friends in the Bitcoin world and you know, they're way more brilliant than me and they've got a 10 year head start uh, understanding the technology. So it's like, I try to understand as much as I can on the technology side, but when there's something I don't understand, I pick up the phone and I'm like, Hey, you get five minutes. Can you just help me understand like in, you know, in, in, in idiot terms for me so that you can, you know, I understand it. So I, I think it's, I think it's a sign of, of honestly how early things are that people, they, they ask you how it works, right? How's the system of mining work? It's like, do you question how the internet works? Do you question how it's working right now that, you know, you and I are talking to each other over some video device? At a certain point, it doesn't really matter uh, because people just start to believe and have faith that the technology works, but it's still just so new um, that a lot of people question really how that system works. And, you know, one thing that I guess, because it's such almost the problem with Bitcoin, I think, in my attempts to explain it to people, is that it's such a big idea that you start to lose people when you really, when they really grasp what you're talking about, because uh, you know, if you if you compare uh, Bitcoin to you know digital gold, that resonates, like people understand that. But really, it's it's kind of more than that at the end of the day. Um, and and I think one question that I have for you is, do you think because a lot of Bitcoin's most ardent supporters will say, well, Bitcoin is going to be the next uh, global reserve asset? A do you believe that? And B, do you believe that Bitcoin has to achieve that status in order to be successful? Which I think is the most more important question, actually. Um, it's a great question. I think, and this is crazy because my view on this has really shifted. I did not think that was likely at all if you would have asked me this probably six to 12 months ago. Um. I, th I think it's possible that it could become a new reserve asset. Um, we've talked about the ways in which it is harder than gold when you look at a stock to flow basis. Um, I think ultimately the biggest energy, you know, sort of the world's proof of stake, if you will, is the world's biggest energy exporters and the world's biggest creditors. They get a say. So if, if China and Russia say, and Saudi get together and say, listen, we value gold at 1,000 barrels per ounce, 1,000 barrels of oil per ounce, or 10,000 barrels of oil per ounce, 
then gold is going to be part of that system. That doesn't mean Bitcoin goes away, but Bitcoin could continue to eat at it, however you want to think about that, but gold's going to have a role. And I think it, gold will probably always have a role, particularly in the eyes of those big energy exporters, because the one thing where gold is different than Bitcoin and arguably superior is that there is no ongoing energy cost to gold. Once, you know, you're Saudi, you sell a bunch of oil, you take a bunch of gold bars, you put those gold bars in a vault. Those gold bars, there is no energy input to keep those gold. Those things will be there in a, in a thousand years. Um, and we know that because we dig them up all the time, right? Um, whereas there's this ongoing energy dividend and uh, or, or energy input that would be required to keep the network going, et cetera, and fees will cover it, et cetera. But if there is a negative, slight negative interest rate there, at some point it becomes maybe more relevant. And so when I think about those things, if I was an energy producer, that, you know, thinking in generational terms as some of these nations might, that's the one thing where I'd say, okay, that, that, could, that could impact it. Now, does that mean... If, if gold has a role in there, uh, does that mean that Bitcoin's not successful to me? But no, I think I, I really have been, I think, it's, I think it's a gold for the people. It's a really, uh, it's, it's, it's just so decentralized, so democratized. You know, my wife asked me, well, what happens if the network goes down? I'm like, their network's been up more than the Fed network's been up over the last 10 years. So they, they, the downtime's lower with Bitcoin than it is with the Fed. So like if I'm not worried about the bank not being able to spit out money, then I shouldn't really be worried about uh, about sort of the, that from from a Bitcoin perspective. So, no, I don't think it has to become the global reserve currency, a reserve asset, I think is a better way of phrasing it, uh, to be successful at all. I think it's likely going to continue to be successful um, on its own merits. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I, I don't think that it has to be uh, the global reserve asset. Um, I actually did not think that until, honestly, it's funny, I was chuckling to myself, as you said, my, sh my thinking may have shifted a little bit in the last six to, six to 12 months, because a lot of stuff that we're seeing right now, you would have said this was impossible. And I think the way that I guess I frame this internally for myself is that the if you believe, which many people do, even non-believers in, in Bitcoin, that um, the reserve currency system as it's structured today has to change and we have to move off a dollar. Well, suddenly any of those options look extreme and weird. And actually in a way with, with how far we've let everything pro progress, we've kind of, if, if everything is a distribution of probabilities in the future, we've kind of narrowed the range to really, really extreme outcomes, I would say. So it's like, if you think about it, let's, let's take it for granted that we're gonna move off of a dollar system. What are your options? Are you gonna go to one other single uh, fiat currency? Seems pretty unlikely, right? Are you gonna go to a basket of currencies? A lot of problems with that too. So what what options are really left? We could go back to the gold standard. We could use some kind of bank or or something like that, or we could do Bitcoin. And honestly, if you think about any one of those probabilities, Bitcoin's just as likely as any of the rest of them. Maybe even a little bit more so. So I don't know. That's that's kind of where I'm at. I, I, I agree. I mean, it, it is. It, it's you know when you look at it as. You know, and we were writing about this in 2014, 2015, 2016. The way you fix this system is you fix the price of you. You, you don't. You know, we, we started with a system that you peg gold was pe dollar was pegged to gold didn't work. Then dollar was pegged to oil didn't work. The fix to the system is you peg oil to gold, and then. That there's this word that decentralizes the decision of each country. Now they can set energy policy based on their own needs. If the U.S. wants expensive oil because we can make a bunch of shale, create a bunch of jobs, create, become energy independent, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, great. We have expensive oil. We have expensive gold. That means we have a weak dollar relative to gold. If the Saudis, they've got nothing but oil. They want a strong currency to import things in. Fine. They, play, they price at the same ratio, the same thousand barrels an ounce, we'll say, but they'll sell oil at 10 cents. So gold in Saudi real is really cheap. And so the real is really strong against the dollar. And so they can buy a lot of stuff from the Americans. It's, it's this bank or concept. Now, if that's the fix and that decentralizes things, 
then what Bitcoin is is effectively that same pegging energy to the reserve asset. It's the same thing. Uh, and then everybody gets to choose. It when you talk about decentralization, it really decentralizes it down to the individual level. Um, so it is. When, when you say it, it, all those things are possible, yeah, because the euro is not going to be it. They don't want to be it. The yuan is not going to be it. They don't want to be it. After that, the list gets really short. The yen, no. You know, sterling, no. There's nothing else in the world. Uh, they did IMF, SDR bonds were bannied, bannered about for a bit 10 years ago, but that's kind of fallen by the wayside. So, yeah, it really has like transitioned for over the last 6, 12 months of like, yeah, no way. And I'm like, well, the bigger it gets, the more likely it gets, really, in terms of market yeah. cap. Totally. And there's just, there's, there's incentive structures, right? Which, you know, as the, the holder base for Bitcoin has become increasingly institutional, right? And it kind of started off with, you know, like the, the kind of out there family offices and, you know, maybe, um, you know, prop traders or something like that, or the more aggressive, uh, you know, hedge funds kind of moved in. But now you're seeing, I, I think the game has really, I, I don't think people have made a big enough deal about uh, insurance companies moving in. Oh, 100% um, agree. Yeah. It's frankly shocking. I mean, it's great, right? But I mean, them moving in, their their set of uh, requirements are so different. Yeah, their regulations the are range. very, very strict. Right, right. And if you think about the job of an insurance company, they're trying to match um, long-term liabilities with long-term assets, right? So buying Bitcoin, I mean, what does that say? From the perspective of, they, they got actuaries, right? Who, who are sitting down and modeling. They know the shit. numbers. They, they, they know the numbers, yeah. man. I mean, no one knows the numbers better than these guys. No, and I've, so, I've got whole life policies, right? And, and like, I bought them in 04. I was doing, you know, I was doing well in 04. And they, they said, hey, buy some whole life insurance policies. You're young and you're skinny and you're making good money. And it's this great loophole, right? Well, the loophole's kind of gotten screwed. I mean, it's still a great loophole, but it's gotten screwed a little bit because no one in 04 said, well, they're going to take rates to zero for 15 years. And, you know, so now all of a sudden, you know, my premiums, which were supposed to do this, have done this. And my, my you know, my, my returns, which were supposed to do this, have done this. And that's their problem in a microcosm. So if they can buy an asset that fixes that, they're going to be all over it. And so to your point, the fact that they've been all over it, they're not, they're not guessing. The actuaries are, it's a very precise, especially when you start talking about things like, you know, Mass Mutual, Northwestern Mutual, it, it's very precise. They're not guessing. Extremely precise. Yeah. All right, look, well, I'm sure we could keep talking for, for hours and hours more, but you've already been super generous with your time. Um, if, if, our, if our viewers want to find out more about you or the work that you do at Forest for the Trees, what's, what's the best way to do that? Absolutely. Yeah. Have them check out our website, please, at fftt-llc.com. They can also look, uh, look me up on Twitter. I've got an active feed there, at Luke Groman, L-U-K-E-G-R-O-M-E-N, all one word. Amazing. You know, look, this was one of those interviews where I, I had my pages of notes. I had them written out right here. I thought we were going to talk about something completely different. And, you know, those are the best, those are the best chats, though. So... I had a ton of fun. Um, Thank thanks you so much for coming on. And we'll have to do it again soon. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. You too.